in physics, which cuts a word in the wrong place in a kind of whimsical way that's reminiscent of campus slang like shrooms for mushrooms or straws for strawberry. So we see scientific language following some of the patterns in uh, the language as a whole. You were talking there about science becoming, um, and the jargon in science becoming less and less formal. Now, if we move to the less formal end of our of our linguistic spectrum, if you like, there's a much publicised chapter in in the book about swearing in all its ungrammatical glory. So, where exactly do these words come from that we now think are swear words, and why they why do they have the potency that they do? One common denominator of the taboo words across different languages is they come from domains of strong negative emotion. There are taboo terms in many languages for deities and supernatural entities and their various various relics and body parts, like our own uh, hell, damn, and Jesus Christ, uh, which involve the emotion of awe and fear of the power of deities. There are many taboo terms for bodily secretions in the organs that uh, that produce them, and that evokes the emotion of disgust. There are, are many sexual imprecations which evoke the emotion of uh, revulsion at sexual depravity. There are often taboo terms for disliked people and groups, uh, such as racial epithets. We don't think of those as dirty words, but of course they function like dirty words, the N-word is the word that could get you fired, whereas the F-word or the S-word no longer will. And that, of course, evokes the emotion of hatred for disfavored groups. But in all cases, there's a strong negative emotion. Now, that's not enough to make a word taboo. In addition, there has to be the recognition that the negative concept is being brought up precisely in order to offend you. And that's the difference between a taboo term like shit and the polite euphemism feces. They're synonyms, but uh, we recognize one to be the term that you use in order to get a rise out of someone, and the other is the term that you use when you have to discuss the topic for some reason, but you want not to get a rise out of them. Why don't they obey grammatical laws like other words then? Why is it okay to say, I don't give a bleep, or it's bleeping brilliant? I mean, those don't semantically mean anything. The words don't add anything to those sentences. And I couldn't intersperse other words that mean a similar thing into those sentences and mean the same thing. That's right. You could even say things like kappa fucking chino or hot fucking dog, which violate all the rules of English. Uh, and, uh, and also, the semantics are nonsensical. Drown the fucking cat doesn't mean drown the cat that is fucking. Uh, the most likely source is that words can substitute for one another when they have the same emotional force, even if they have different grammatical and semantic properties. And I suspect that most of the very strange epithets, uh, like close the fucking door, which doesn't seem to make any sense, evolve from religious epithets that lost their force as religion came to play a smaller role in our emotional lives. So close the goddamn door. Uh, it does make sense. If something is damned, then it is uh, pitiable, execrable, of no, no earthly use. As damned started to lose its sting, but there still was that slot in the sentence, you used fuck to substitute for it. And all of the strange expressions with fuck have intelligible religious antecedents. Fuck you, which also makes no sense. No one knows what it means. I mean, every, if you ask people, they, everyone comes up with a different explanation. I uh, came from damn you, or you know, may God damn you. Where the fuck are you going came from where in the hell are you going. Holy shit, holy fuck came from Holy Mary. Uh, so you have a, a strange phenomenon, which I don't think you see anywhere else in the language, of words substituting for each other simply because of their taboo status, running roughshod over distinctions of grammar and meaning. Well, I was going to um, conclude by asking on the, about the flip side of of swearing and cursing and how that has to be politeness. Um, the reason why I would say, I don't suppose you'd like to sit here, Professor Pinker, as opposed to <laughs> sit there, Steve. We have straightforward words for straightforward things, but why don't we just say what we mean a bit more often? Yes. I think it's because humans are very touchy about their relationships. There are a number of different relationship types that govern human social interaction. Unlike other animals, which um, deal with each other in a... Uh, a very circumscribed number of ways, we can flip back and forth between the kind of distribution of resources that we have between a, a, a pair of people. So we have dominance, you give me what I want. We have reciprocity, uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. We have uh, mutualism or communality, 
what's mine is thine, what's thine is mine. But you got to know which one is in force at a given time, because if you mix them up, you could do something seriously wrong. Uh, I can help myself to a shrimp off the plate of my wife or girlfriend at a party, but I can't go up to a stranger or my boss and help myself to a shrimp off their plate. That would be larceny. A married couple can solicit each other for sex, but not a, uh, a student and a professor. When we use language, sometimes the actual proposition that we use changes the relationship. And if you're uncertain that the other person is ready to do that, then you're taking a risk that if they're not willing to go along with it, uh, your relationship is forever changed. As in a sexual come on, you can no longer pretend that you're colleagues or friends if the sexual proposition has been made in the open, at least not on, the, on pain of being irrational or manipulative. On the other hand, if the sexual come on is veiled, then the recipient can choose to pretend that it was a, a literal request to see etchings or to have coffee. Uh, turn it down without both parties having to acknowledge that they, they have switched from one relationship type to another. And so it is with polite requests. If I request the salt through some imperative, as linguists call it, like if you could pass the salt, that would be great, then I haven't bossed you around. But since you assume that I haven't lost my mind, that I'm not just talking in non sequiturs, you know that I really do want the salt. And so we accomplish both the relationship maintenance and the communication of information simultaneously. Now I have one final question for you, and it's really just out of curiosity. Do you have a favorite word that you think should be in the English language and isn't? Oh, like a, a, a sniglet? Yes, like uh, a sniglet. Or a, a lif to, uh, to, to allude to uh, Douglas Adams and... Uh, uh, book The Meaning of Lif, words that, that don't exist but should. Well, I think a uh, uh, hextable is useful. That is the uh, one record album in someone's collection that makes you sure you could never go out with them. <laughs> and uh, a lamlash, uh, the folder full of astoundingly dull information found on hotel dressing tables, <laughs> both Wonderful. courtesy of Douglas Adams and John Lloyd. My favourite of theirs is it has to be woking, walking into the kitchen and forgetting why you went there in the first place. <laughs> Stephen Pinker, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.